Hi, and welcome to this video on Warshall's algorithm. In a previous video, we defined the transitive closure of a relation R on a set A to be the smallest transitive relation that contains R. We start with a relation R that may not be transitive and then add edges onto it until it is transitive. And we know which edges to add because of a theorem that says that a pair AB belongs to R star, which is our notation for the transitive closure, if and only if there is a path of edges from A to B. In the previous video, we drew the transitive closure of a relation by looking at the relation's digraph and then visually determining which edges to add and then drawing them. This is okay for learning pur purposes, but in actual practice, this is impractical because we might be working with relations that have thousands or even millions of nodes and edges, and therefore we need a computer to help us determine which edges to add, and computers can't see things. So Warshall's algorithm is a technique for finding the transitive closure of a relation, focusing on the adjacency matrix for that relation. Before we get to the algorithm itself, let's review a few bits of terminology about matrices that we're going to need. First of all, recall that the adjacency matrix for a directed graph is a square matrix with a number of rows and columns equal to the number of nodes in the graph. And inside the matrix, we're going to put a 1 in the position at row i, column j, if there is an edge pointing from i to j, and then put a 0 otherwise. If M is the name of the matrix, then we will refer to this IJ entry as MIJ, and as a convention, we'll index the rows and columns starting at zero. For example, here is a directed graph and its adjacency matrix. Since there is an edge pointing from zero to two, we can look in row zero, column two, which is here, and we would call this the zero two entry of the matrix, and there we see a one. There is no edge pointing from node five to node three, so in the five three entry, which is here, there is a zero. Warshall's algorithm manipulates this adjacency matrix by thinking of the entries as bits and then performing logical operations on the bits. Let's review for a second the two logical operations that we will see. Now in basic logic, we learned about the AND and OR operations on true-false values, which we can think of as bits, with 1 standing in for true and 0 standing in for false. In the AND operation, the result of two bits operated together is a 1, if and only if the two bits themselves are 1. On the other hand, if we join two bits with OR, then the result is 1 if either one of the bits involved or both of the bits involved are 1, and we get a 0 otherwise. That's actually all the math that Warshall's algorithm actually uses. Let's move on to discuss the basic gist behind what this algorithm is supposed to do. For that, take a look at this directed graph that has six nodes. How would we build the transitive closure of this relation? Well, first of all, in the transitive closure, all of the original edges must stay put. So if there is already a link from one node to another, the algorithm will put that edge into the transitive closure. The first thing the algorithm is going to do is look through the pairs of nodes in the graph and look for all unconnected second level relations. For example, A has a second level connection to E because B acts as a linking node. There is an edge from A to B and then an edge from B to E. So in the transitive closure, we would need to add a direct edge from A to E. What other second level connections does A have? Well, keep A locked in and look for edges that start at A and end somewhere else that's two edges away. There's another such connection from A to C that goes through B, so add in this edge from A to C. Those are the only two second level connections that this graph has starting at A. So now I'll move on to B and look for second level connections starting at B and add an edge where you see them. There are two of these from B to F and from B to D. Now we can continue to loop through all the nodes until we add all the initial second level connections that were in the directed graph. At this point, however, we don't stop because by adding in these pink second level connections, we have now created new second level connections. So we need to loop through again and look for any new second level connections that could be made. For example, starting at A, since we linked A to C in the first round, there is now a second level connection from A to F. 
in the original digraph without the pink edges, this was a third level relationship. A is connected to F by a path of three edges. However, the first round of edge adding reduces this to a second level connection. And so in this iteration, we're going to add a new edge here. Likewise, in the original, there's a third level connection from A to D. That's a path of three edges. But now, this is a second level connection thanks to the edge that we added from A to C in the first iteration. So since this is now a second level connection, we will add an edge from A to D. There are no other unconnected second level connections now starting at A. So we would move on to B and look for any newly created second level connections that start at B. There happen to be none of these, so we move on to C and so on. Now in general practice, what could happen is that these third level connections that were just added might create new second level connections that hadn't been discovered yet. For example, if there were a node, let's say G, that were out here four edges away from A, then the iteration that we just completed would add an edge that gets us three edges along that path. And so now G would be two edges away from A. So what we would need to do is iterate once more through all the edges and again, look for any newly created second level connections that happened in the previous round. Since there are only six nodes in the graph, you can convince yourself that the longest possible connection that could ever happen between any two nodes is six edges. So the algorithm should loop through each pair of nodes six times before we can be assured that all the edges that could be added have been added. And now we are looking at the transitive closure because we have explored all possible connections of all possible lengths and added edges where a path exists. So that's the gist of how this algorithm works. But before we look at it in code, we need to go back once more and think about matrices because again, computers can't see things like we do. So the algorithm first and foremost has to preserve all the edges that were in the original relation. Now we can do this by simply making a copy of the adjacency matrix of the original relation and just locking in the ones that would be present, which are here on this slide shaded in blue. The algorithm then proceeds to iterate through the graph and if necessary, flip the bits from zero to one if it discovers a second level connection that hasn't been closed off yet. Now, without seeing the graph, how does the algorithm know that there is a second level connection? Well, we humans found second level connections by finding linking nodes. For example, B is a node that links A to C. We can see this in the matrix. We can see that there is a link because there is a one in the row for A and column for B, and also a one in the column for B and a row for C. This pair of ones, one of them coming in row zero, column one, and the other in row one, column two, indicates a link. And so we would need to flip the bit that is in row zero, column two. That's the edge from A to C that jumps over B. Now likewise, these three bits would need to be flipped too. For example, here in row one, column three, we need to change this to a one because there's a one in row one, column two, and a one in row two, column three. Now that's just code for saying that there's an edge from B to C and then from C to D, and so we need an edge from B to D. But just like in the visual algorithm, once we flip the bits in these four positions through the first iteration, this might create some new second level connections that weren't there already. So we loop back through all the pairs of nodes. We'll need to flip the bits in these two positions in the second round. One of these is in row zero, column three, because there is a one in row zero, column two, or at least there will be once we flip it, and then a one in row two, column three, that was already there. So generally speaking, Warshall's algorithm will place a one in the ij entry of the adjacency matrix if one of two things is true. Either the ij entry was already a one, or there is some linking position k such that both the ik entry is a one and the kj entry is a one. So finally, let's unveil some code that implements this algorithm. Here's a version of this algorithm that's written specifically for the Sage Math computer algebra system. This is basically Python with a few modifications. The link you see here takes you directly to a GitHub gist where you can copy the code and play with it. Let's look at it line by line, and if you understood the discussion we just had about how the algorithm works and this code will make perfect sense. So line one is just the function declaration and we're passing the adjacency matrix M for the original relation off to our function. 
In line two, we're going to set n equal to the number of rows in the matrix. And we're going to assume here that the user is smart and only enters n square matrices. In line three, we make a copy of m to use. Now in lines four through six, we see a three-fold for loop. This encodes what we did in the visual example earlier. In the inner two loops, what we're doing is looping over all possible pairs of nodes, looking for connections from i to j. In the outer loop, we're looking for linking nodes, and that is what k represents. Now the real work happens here in line 7. Remember that we're going to set the ij entry of the matrix equal to 1 if one of two things happens. Either the ij entry was already 1, or if there is some k such that both the ik and kj entries are 1. This logical statement here in line 7 is exactly this condition verbatim. The OR and AND you see in line 7 are logical operators. So for example, if the two entries inside the parentheses here are 1, then ANDing them together, joining them together with AND, will also produce a 1. Finally, when we've done all the looping, we return the modified matrix, and that is the adjacency matrix for the transitive closure. Now that's all for this video. In the next video, we're going to step through the algorithm by hand using a small example to see how all of this fits together. Thanks for watching.